Greetings in Christ. I'm Pastor John Fritz of Hope Evangelical Lutheran Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning for the fourth Sunday of Easter in the year of our Lord, 2023. The theme for our service and sermon are the words of St. Peter, This is a gracious thing. Our opening song this morning is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Greetings in Christ. I'm Pastor John Fritz of Hope Evangelical Lutheran Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning for the fourth Sunday of Easter in the year of our Lord, 2023. The theme for our service and sermon are the words of St. Peter, This is a gracious thing. Our opening song this morning is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the sure and certain hope that God, our Heavenly Father, is eager to hear us for Christ's sake. Follow along silently as I pray on behalf of the Church. O Lord Jesus, gracious and good shepherd, you act in grace, mercy, and love to save a people for yourself from the lost and fallen multitudes. You alone are responsible for saving us and all who believe. The Good Shepherd bled and died and rose to life again to save sheep who love to wander. Even after giving us new life in the still waters of baptism, we are tempted to follow bad shepherds or charge ahead of your leadership on our own. Forgive us all our sins that we may praise your name. Amen. In the eternal counsel of God, he planned to save us from sin, death, and the devil. The perfectly, eternally good shepherd, Jesus Christ, willingly did and suffered all that was necessary for us and for our salvation. His Holy Spirit even breathed life into us through the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. On the basis of your confession in the stead of and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We respond to God's gracious absolution of our sin by singing, God of Grace. Reaches 
please join me in the familiar words of Psalm 23, our psalm for today. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our first lesson for today is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 25. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel lesson is John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Our sermon hymn today is Amazing Grace. Thank you. 
And St. Peter says, this is a gracious thing, this is a gracious thing. You should probably pay attention to find out exactly what that gracious thing happens to be. Whether we like it or not. When my wife was in high school, she decided to take German because she wanted to know what those loud words her grandpa would say to her mom when he didn't want the children to hear. And so she studied German and they didn't actually teach those words that grandpa was shouting in his peak and displeasure. But one of the things they did to try to make learning another language more fun and more accessible was to have parties based on various themes. And I remember for one of those parties, she described Gefferlius Ding as someone dressed up in an outfit that looked rather like a large pickle or cucumber. And that was as close as that German club in Wausau, Wisconsin, the center of the universe, was able to get to defining a dangerous thing which is, I guess, a rough translation of Gefährliches Ding. This gracious thing that St. Peter talks about can at times be a dangerous thing for those of us who are led by the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us over and over again that he is the Lamb of God, and in John 10 it says he lays down his life for his flock, and he picks it up again, and he does that out of love and mercy and compassion for fallen sinners like you and me, and that if the world treated him with mocking and brutalization, and even death, we shouldn't expect to be treated better than our Lord and Master. When many of the folks on TV claiming to be faithful pastors get to this section of the Gospel lesson, they focus almost exclusively on, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly and they propose that if only you sanctify your money by giving it into their personal pockets so that they can have multi-million dollar mansions and all the accoutrement of luxury and relaxation in this life, that somehow God will ultimately be forced by your arm twisting with your tithes and offerings to make you a millionaire as well. It's not really the case. One of the graces that God talks about in his word, which is quite frightening to believers, and as Martin Luther said, the wallet or the purse is the last part of a man to be converted. One of those graces is called the grace of giving. And we're not going to focus on that scary grace this morning. But what does St. Peter say is a gracious thing? This is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And then he repeats it. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God when you do good and suffer for it and you endure. Those graces, along with patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, those fruits of the Holy Spirit, these graces here are specifically called charisms or charis, gifts of the Holy Spirit for believers. And while the neo-Pentecostalism that has arisen in our country generally focuses on extraordinary gifts which we believe were only present until the perfect, that is the complete, New Testament was finished. They don't focus so much on 
this grace of enduring unjust suffering while loving the person who is causing you to suffer. Our Good Shepherd came to seek and to save the lost, and everybody in this human race is lost. You only need to look at the newspapers or watch the news briefly for the evening recap in a large metropolitan area like ours just outside Chicago to find out how many people were shot and how many even toddlers and grandmas and everybody in between have been victims of crime and violence. And it is incredibly sad to see the grip that sin has on us. In God's Word, He lets us know that the grace of God is resistible, that we're all born spiritually dead, and that we need Christ to give us forgiveness, life, and salvation because of what He did for us by not resisting those who would cruelly abuse Him and punish Him for doing what was just and right and perfect and honorable in following God's plan of salvation. Yet, just like that grace of giving where, ooh, that's going to cost us something, this grace, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly, that costs us something as well. Doing good and suffering for it and enduring in the faith and perhaps even growing in the faith and growing in Christ-likeness, that's something that does not come to us naturally. We want our rights. We want to stand on our rights. We want that person who slighted us, who dissed us in even the most insignificant way to get what's coming to them. And we don't mean by that we want them to repent and receive Christ as Savior and with Him receive forgiveness, eternal life, and salvation and the most satisfying way of life here on earth as we await His return and fulfill His role for us and His call on our lives. Now, when somebody slights us, we have a tendency to get our nose a little bit out of joint, maybe a lot out of joint. Think about the last time you were driving at a four-way stop sign or trying to drive the speed limit on the highway or trying to drive what you think is an appropriate amount over the speed limit as a citizen scofflaw and somebody comes up and drives in a manner which you feel is inappropriate. Even such slights as that can trigger less than enduring faithful responses in us fallen, poor, miserable sinners. And when our government celebrates child murder and child mutilation and perversion and sets aside an entire month, especially for appreciating deviance and perversion in June and special days of appreciation of those with gender dysphoria who actually do need help but not affirmation of their disordered understanding of who they are as beings created in the image and likeness of God. Our government can call us haters, our culture can call us haters, and our God calls us instead to endure faithfully standing on the Word, not on our own supposed self-righteousness, because we need saving every bit as much as every other human that's ever been conceived in the natural way. We know the depths of our sin. That's why pastors often wear these clerical shirts that are as inky black as we can find them, just with a tiny bit of white over our vocal cords 
And that white is to represent that as we're sharing the word of God, at least something pure can come out of these poor, miserable beings. God challenges you and me to grow in grace. We get into the word of the Lord. We see how he raised us from death in our baptism, gifted us with saving faith, and how he feeds and nourishes us for our challenging, sometimes our desiccating, dry life through this wilderness of sin. And it is his food, his real body, his real blood, his real gospel that strengthens us and empowers us to endure. This is a gracious thing, but it's a gracious thing not everybody really wants to participate in all the time. Just like the grace of becoming more patient or more self-controlled. Well, how does that get worked in your life? It's not just by looking at God's word and saying, please help me to be more gracious and more kind and more self-controlled, but God gives you the experience to exercise patience, to exercise self-control. And those are graces that we'd rather he gave to other people in our lives so that they could give them to us as gifts and so our lives could be easier. But the challenge, especially in this post-Christian age, is for us to receive these gracious things, to embrace them through the power of the Holy Spirit and to grow in our sanctification. You see, in justification, as God converts us in an instant and places Christ's righteousness on us and clothes us with the righteousness of Christ and buries us in baptism with Christ and raises us to new life, that's an instant activity, and the moment we first believe, the Holy Spirit wants us to participate in sanctification, in embracing the graces of God and growing more and more into the people he plans for us to be. Never perfect in this life because even St. Paul in Romans 7 reminds that we're not going to get there perfectly but we can make progress through the power of the Holy Spirit. The challenge for you and for me this week and every day that we trod this groaning creation is to embrace all the graces of God, not just those that we really appreciate, but even the ones that are challenging and that lead us to behave sincerely more and more like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd who laid down his life for the flock so that you and I and all who repent of our sins could trust in him, could have that eternal joyful feast that never ends up in heaven with him and with all those who receive his word, perhaps even some that receive his word from us. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, amen. Now may the peace of God in Christ Jesus rise up like a sentinel and keep your hearts and minds in peace. Amen. Please join me as we confess the faith that saves in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O oh, gracious God above, your entrance into our hearts through the means of grace changed us in an instant, 
adopted us into your family and justified us with the righteousness Christ won for us on the cross. Give us the desire to grow in grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit increase our desire to grow in sanctification as individuals and as a church body. As our culture revels in murder and even common courtesy and everyday kindnesses are increasingly rare, empower us to let our light shine before men so that our Father in heaven is glorified. We also ask and pray for your healing for those we name in our hearts. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Our closing song today is Blessed Be Your Name. <laughs> 